Welcome to the Cranbrook Dining Hall and this celebration of 40 years for uh, Rich and Betsy here on the Cranbrook campus. Uh, you know, as, as Rich said at the uh, girls' ceremony this morning, uh, it's really not so hard to do 40 years. You just have to do one, and then you do another, and then you do another, and so on. Uh, my name is Greg Miller. I'm your Master of Ceremonies this, uh, this evening. Uh, I'm the head of the Upper School Science Department, and I've had the uh, distinct pleasure of being able to work with both Rich and Betsy over the years, Betsy particularly when she was our registrar, and uh, Rich uh, as the computer uh, department head, and I as the science department head, we get to share an office. If any of you have ever visited our office, uh, there's a distinct difference between our two office halves that uh, although right now I'm not sure there's that much of a difference, uh, mine's a disaster at the moment, but um, you know, we're not always in there at the same time, so there are these, there are these times that I get to reflect a little bit on, um, on Rich's office space as I'm sitting doing something, I look up and uh, see that disaster over there, and I've often thought that, you know, if his, if his office were a hard drive, he just needs to run a defrag. <laughs> on it. But I think Rich is thankful that we've gone to solid states and those don't need defrag anymore, so. Um, I think Charlie asked me to host tonight because, I mean, what, what, what better person than to have one nerd talking about a couple of other nerds? And so, uh, so I was very honored by the invitation. Um, I've got to uh, make a little bit of a uh, confession for you. Uh, as a self-described nerd, one of the things I've, I'm really interested in are numbers, and it's not the numbers themselves so much, you know, thinking about, well, what's so special about the number three or the number seven? or rather the questions that sort of come to mind when you begin thinking about numbers, things like, you know, why is it that we count in base 10? Or why are there 360 degrees in a circle? You know, why, why aren't there 500? And uh, there are some great stories. And, and part, of, I mean, part of the story of the world is wrestling with questions like this because I think it gets into our own organic nature. But, for the uninitiated, you've got to ask this question, why do we celebrate 40, 40 years at Cranbrook? I mean, well, sure, 10 special too, and isn't 20 special? And 50 is really special. Do we just take 40 because that's going to be the last decade opportunity to, you know, nobody's got that kind of endurance to, uh, <laughs> to make it that long here? Um, but there's actually a reason for the number 40. And that, oh, I, I'm sorry, Rich. 40, I meant uh, 0010, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, zero years. <laughs> um, anybody who's attended a boy's graduation will know this reason for the 40 years on. And that reason starts with a school located northwest of England called the Harrow School. Now, the Harrow School is a very old, over 700 year old school in England. I, can you, I can't even begin to imagine anything that old, let alone a school. Boy, well, we talk about traditions, whew. Um, and uh, you know, they've obviously graduated a number of recognizable names over the years, Winston Churchill being among, their, among the graduates. But there's a song uh, called the Harrow School Song that was written in 1864 by their then music teacher, a fellow by the name of John Farmer. And it's a song that's captured the hearts and interests, I suppose, of many other schools. Many schools, other than just Cranbrook and the Harrow School, sing the Harrow School song at important events and graduations. The song is not just a story about the life of a schoolboy, but it's more a story about recalling the life of a schoolboy and what their lives are going to look like 40 years on. Now, again, here's this question, why 40 years on? And the answer is, you've got to remember, we're talking about a song written in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, at that time, it turns out that if you were 18 years old, you could expect to live, statistically, another 40 years. And so that was going to be your life term. I know I often think to myself, thank heavens things have gotten better. Uh, you know, today, if you make it to 20, statistically speaking, you've got another 57 years to go. Um, and so this is the reason why 40 is our celebration. We celebrate 40 because of the importance of this song 
to not just the Harrow School, but also the importance of this song to uh, Cranbrook School. If any of you have ever had the luck to come across a copy of Bruce Coulter's book, 40 Years On, again, it's a great history of the first 40 years of the boys' school here at Cranbrook, and I should tell you that uh, Betsy Clark has written an equivalent uh, piece on Kingswood School as well. Do try to get yourself a copy of those because they make for great reading and give you some wonderful insight into this place. So 40 years, 1977. I mean, let's think back. Now, for some of you, this is going to be you know, a walk down memory lane, and for others of you, this is going to be a little bit of a history lesson. But 1977, here are some of the things that were happening in 1977. In 1977, in the news, Jimmy Carter's president. New York City had the 25-hour blackout. And you may recall that, even though the population in New York City was declining at the time, there was a population bump or spike nine months later. <laughs> the Trans-Alaskan oil pipeline was being built. Uh, Seattle Slough was the 10th winner of the Triple Crown. Uh, world population, 58% of what it is today. Uh, first flight of the space shuttle on the back of a commercial jet liner. You may remember how they used to test it for its aerodynamics. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, the two furthest reaching human-made uh, objects that have traveled further in the solar system, well, beyond the solar system, further in the universe than any other known uh, species-made object. Uh, you may recall those. Those are the ones that are carrying those Really, I'd love to get a copy of these. Those really cool gold records. You know, I've got the sounds of the whales on them and images that suggest dimensions of the human species and on and on and on. Um, and the MRI was invented. Now, on the movies and music side, we're talking Star Wars, Saturday Night Fever, Smokey and the Bandit. And on the music side, you've got the Bee Gees, How Deep Is Your Love, and Eagles Hotel California. And you're going, holy, that's 40, that, no, that can't be 40 years ago. Or in matters of money, um, inflation rate. Now here's where it's not such a good old days. Inflation rate is 6.5%. 6.5% inflation in 1977, and it only got worse in the, in the soon to be years that followed. Uh, Dow, Jones, Dow Jones Industrial Average, 831. What do we close at today? Over 20,000 again? Um, average income per year, 15,000. Price of gas, 65 cents a gallon. Now, if you think that sounds like a deal, though, take that 6% average inflation. If you run it over 40 years, that would make a gallon of gas cost $6.70 today. So we've got a, we've got, in some ways, we've got a better today than when Rich and Betsy first landed on campus. Um, fashion. So, um, I got looking at this because I went into the uh, yearbooks to take a look at, I was looking for a young couple, and uh, I came across a photo of Rich and Betsy uh, taking this part of the upper school science department, and Betsy was wearing this uh, checkered vest, which uh, was actually one of the fashion highlights of 1977. Checkers, checkered clothing uh, was something of a hit as well, some loud plaid clothing. Um, men's suede jumpsuits. Now, I don't remember this, but, but then I thought, well, that, that's not too far off because I started thinking about Rich dressing up as somebody on this, from the Star Trek, Star Trek Enterprise and uh, beaming around campus. Um, it's, it, anyway, fashion is, fashion is a tough thing. And then on the computers and technology front, you know, in 1977, 48 kilobytes of primary memory was considered huge operating space. And when, you, when I compare it to my computer today that has 8 gigabytes primary memory, I mean, that's 21,000 times more memory on the computer today than what, than what we had 40 years ago. Uh, cassette tapes were being used as a primary secondary storage. Um, you had uh, 16 colors on your monitor, which was pretty awesome. Um, you had the Bomar Brain Calculator. Uh, that's uh, exactly, my wife, my wife had a Bomar Brain as well, and I was really bothered by it because when she showed it to me uh, as she was graduating from high school, 
I took the square root of 4 on it and returned a value of 1.99999. And I know I shouldn't have been bothered, but I was. Um, I'm sure that's why Bomar is not with us any longer today. Apple introduced the Apple II computer and Radio Shack. Uh, one of my favorite computers was the TRS-80, or Trash-80 as we affectionately called it. So that's 1977. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that walk down memory lane. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned that in that photo, uh, Rick, Betsy was sporting the checkered vest. Um, Ed Van Dam is right in front of Rich Lamb in that particular photo, and I noticed that they were maybe both trying to start a trend-setting style, and that was diminished, diminished amount of hair on their heads. Um, that style didn't stick, however. Well, in any case, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we've got some really fine speakers uh, for you to hear, uh, some wonderful stories and reflections about Rich and Betsy, uh, their influence on their lives, and uh, influence on this place, well, that many of us call home, Cranbrook. Um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, April Roach Shoneman. She's class of 2002. She's a classmate of Andy Lamb's. April graduated uh, from Cranbrook and went to Kettering University. But those of you familiar with the Kettering program know that they do internships where you sort of balance this work and going to school thing. You go to work for a while and then you come back and go to school. And April was telling me that on her 18th birthday, she was interviewing for a job at the company where she now works, uh, Robert Bosch, which is, uh, she works as a senior account manager, or the Robert, I'm sorry, Robert Bosch. And the Robert Bosch company is a technology services company that uh, does a lot of work over many sectors of the industry, of many different industries. And I'm really eager to hear what April has to say about the lambs. April. Fortunately, we're not here to talk about me. It's a, it's a shorter story than you think. I think I was more affluent in my high school years. But uh, here we are, surrounded by so many intelligent people. Uh, among us, we have our robotics geeks, self-professed, computer wizards, maybe some software Jedi, some other nerds. You get the idea. So I think I'll start the evening with uh, a few numbers for you. And those are... What are the result of combining 319 acres of a beautiful campus, six schools with over 1,600 students every year, over 100 faculty, uh, and 40 years of commitment? The answer isn't possible with your calculator if you're reaching into your pocket, protect your pockets. The answer is an opportunity to touch the lives of thousands of people over the span of your 40-year successful career. Most of us, outside of the educational world in particular, don't take the time to reminisce and simply forget the people who influenced our adolescent lives. They were there, training us, guiding us, teaching us, but most importantly, just listening to us. Tonight, we have the unique opportunity to not only remember, but also honor and thank a pair of special individuals who have spent the last 40 years supporting Cranbrook and directly impacting the lives of so many of us. <clears throat> Part of their success is the adamant stance that a good educator is nothing more than a good facilitator. I'm stealing quotes. You can provide an opportunity for the kids to do what they choose and allow them to discover what they need to know. Rich and Betsy Lamb joined Cranbrook 40 years ago due to their shared development paths. They both attended prep schools similar to Cranbrook in Massachusetts. That school, those schools, um, hosted a shared prom where they were not actually each other's dates. <laughs> but they managed to make a connection and date all through college. Rich pursued a degree in psychology due to the lack of computer science degrees at the time. And that degree actually enabled him to have the most uh, fluid experience uh, in taking other classes which may involve computers. Uh, Betsy uh, pursued social, soci social science degrees. And uh, when Rich came out and interviewed with the schools, 
Apparently, uh, the, the head of the science department at the time, Dom Morinelli, decided to hire Betsy for the science department at the boys' middle school, regardless of the social science degree. I guess he forgot the word social in that. So, <laughs> Regardless, Betsy prospered in the role, and Cranbrook grew richer through that acquisition. We can see that evidence in both the upper school computer science program today and also the boys' middle school science program. So Betsy wasn't only a teacher or a registrar for the last 40 years. Her experiences as a mother inspired her and her passions to develop a Cranbrook Robotics program, which has grown today. It began with elementary school programs, Odyssey of the Mind and Destination Imagination, but now we have it in every grade level in every school. Uh, my memories in particular began with Betsy 18 years ago in those exact programs. An inner city kid transferred to Cranbrook with one major loss in coming to the schools. A passion for FIRST Robotics, which wasn't in existence here. Fortunately for me, Betsy was already actively involved and was pulling strings within the school's administration departments to enable us to found a team. So you assume the rest is history, right? Not quite. Robotics is nowhere near your common typical sports, not recognized as an interscholastic sport. Uh, the funding is astronomical to compete, to send students around. Uh, you have to have a sponsorship with an engineering corporation. You have to have engineering mentors, some of the same ones that are actually here tonight as well. And we thank you for being here. I don't see where, where they are, but um, so on and so on. Uh, we also have the weekend build schedules the evening build schedule, students that stay up till midnight and beyond and can think of nothing else because they're passionate about it. And so was Betsy and her poor family. <laughs> I wonder sometimes if they ever saw her and I thank them for sharing her with us and I thank them for being uh, dragged along to some of the events. Uh, Katie actually told me that there was rarely a family incursion uh, that they went on that didn't involve their mom's infamous backpack because, trust me, it would have taken so much that, again, students don't recognize at the time and don't have a chance to thank their teachers for and what they do. I do recall the burden to be quite heavy from this upper school program alone, and I also don't recall much of what was going on with the elementary and middle school programs, but Betsy did continue to push it into all of those areas. Her efforts were recognized by her peers and students when she was nominated and awarded 2012 Mentor of the Year in the REC program, Robotics and Education Competition Foundation. But of course, Betsy isn't in it for the accolades. She's been quoted, the best moments are when the teams are hard at work, the music is flowing, the kids are sharing, building skills with the younger teams, and everything in the lab is just humming. I would personally argue that her robotics competitions are her most well-known impact, but Betsy was also humbly in the background of many other on-campus activities. She and Rich lived on campus, shared in dorm duties, supported school events, sporting events, and for my own personal memory, provided an endless shuttle service and endless snacks. How many parents in the room are still the old-fashioned Betty Crackers? because I personally remember showing up at her house after school and there were always fresh baked warm cookies. So as my speech began tonight, I remind you that we rarely have the opportunity to reach out and thank those people who have impacted us. Please do find the time this evening to reach out to Rich and Betsy and share a story that makes you say thank you. Or how about, now I get what you were saying. <laughs> As for me, I'm eternally grateful for Betsy and her robotics team efforts, not only for me, but for all of us who were first introduced to STEM fields and perhaps turned them into our passions. Please raise a glass or give them a warm hug, but at least a warm, a warm round of applause to thank Betsy and Rich for all of the overflowing support of the schools, their endless dedication to education, and for all that they do.